governance and transparency a way forward. I want to first uh, begin this panel by acknowledging that this event is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I am Lisa Monchel, and I was really honored to, uh, when I was asked by my colleague uh, Mike Larson to help help out today and, and chair uh, this panel. And I teach at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in the Department of Criminology. And um, I moved out to BC from Ontario, and that it was in 2011. And I am Algonquin, Métis, Huron, and I'm also mixed with Scottish from my mom. So today, you're going to be hearing from two amazing speakers. We have um, Rob Botterell. And it, he is an associate counsel um, uh, with the Aboriginal major project negotiation with Lidstone and Company. And he focuses on major project negotiations, uh, law drafting, Aboriginal law, resource law. He advocates on behalf of clients. So really very exciting. Looking forward to hearing from Rob. Um, we also have Wamish Hamilton. I was actually very excited when I saw his name because I've read some of his work. He is a reporter with Discourse Media. He's, he has won three BC Yukon Community Newspaper Association Awards, three Canadian Community Newspaper Association Awards, and his work has been published with CBC, Canadian Press, Globe and Mail, Metro, the TIE. So very exciting. So I was asked to also give a little bit of a context. So, um, you know, when I, when I heard the title Indigenous Governance and Transparency, for me, when I, when I think about Indigenous Governance... Right away, I'm reminded of the vast number of advanced systems of governance Indigenous peoples um, had and, and that we still have. And I'm also reminded of the strength of the various nations across Turtle Island in resisting governments who have tried and, you know, these governments who still try to disrupt these advanced systems. Now, um, you know, my area is, is background is in is in justice, so I have a little bit more of a slant to that. So for me, one thing I question is who has played a lead role in this. Um, and the reality is is that those who are supposedly said to try and achieve justice in Canada, so and that's that's the the police. So we have to remember that one of the primary reasons that, uh, for example, the Northwest Mounted Police, which would later become the RCMP, was formed in 1873, was to actually appease indigenous resistance to settler colonization and to so-called deal with indigenous peoples in, uh, you know, impeding on settlers' plans and priorities. Because indigenous peoples, we were viewed actually as this obstacle, the main obstacle of the police, and, um, you know, the idea was that, you know, once the police overcame this obstacle, the original plan was actually to disband the police force. They were actually never meant to even be permanent. Uh, mounted police forces in Canada were, you know, relied upon by colonial governments to go in and facilitate Indigenous people's subjugation to colonial law. Um, you know, so something I, that came to mind when I thought about uh, these, these issues. And when I think about transparency, I think also about the lack of transparency by the government to Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, such as with the treaties whereby government officials would say one thing and, and do another. Um, and then I, at the same time I asked, well, what has changed what, what is different, you know, today? Are, are the police doing things different today? Well, we have to remember the roots of policing in Canada, and we can see in how in many ways their original structures and mandates have become embedded, entrenched, they live on. Uh, for instance, sociology professor Elizabeth Comack has explained Indigenous peoples are still defined as troublesome populations by the police. And she goes on to explain the similar role played by the North West Mounted Police um, uh, and contemporary police forces in Canada. And she talks about this, this shared thing still, managing problem populations, um, those who are deemed troublesome. And we can see this still happening today. Uh, for example, in Elsie Booktook, 2013, 
Uh, the people of Elsie Booktook never gave up their rights to resources or land, so rightfully, they, rightfully so, they stood up against gas exploration uh, to conduct fracking on their unceded territory. But not only were they subjected to a raid by the RCMP, um, but also through obtaining documents through an access to information request, criminology professor at Carleton, Jeffrey Monaghan, uh, identified 35 individuals who participated in this resistance were actually found on an RCMP threat list. So again, what has really changed? The police have actually made uh, lists up with phone numbers, cars they owned, and so on. And then in addition to these 35 people involved in the resi resistance at Rexton, they weren't the only ones being watched. 89 other Indigenous activists were covertly profiled by the RCMP, also identified as threats. Now, I'll finish up here, you know, just by saying, you know, this surveilling of Indigenous peoples, this isn't something uncommon. Uh, for example, uh, you might have heard of... Um, Dr. Cindy Blackstock, an uh, amazing Gitsan ac academic who actually has spoken about equal rights for Indigenous children in the child welfare system. Seems like a really important issue, speaking for the rights of children. Well, she was also someone um, who was considered suspicious, a person of interest. Um, and Cindy wrote an opinion piece on her experience because she was actually... Uh, through access to information, they, they found, she found that she received, this is a quote from her, hundreds of pages of government documents revealing that 189 federal government officials from the Department of Justice and Aboriginal Affairs were routinely spying on my personal Facebook page, collecting information about my family, friends, me, and uh, my, my family, friends, and me, and distributing it to other government officials. So I'll leave it at that. That is kind of just my little overall synopsis of uh, where I kind of felt when I, when I heard this topic. And um, I don't know if the talks are going to be related, and that's okay. I just wanted to kind of give a broad sense of what I thought. So without further ado, I'm very excited and honored to be listening to our two wonderful speakers today. I um, thank you very much. I, I uh, want to take this opportunity to uh, talk about three areas um, and and try and relate them to uh, the way forward for Indigenous governance and transparency. And the first one is that. Uh, Years ago, uh, when uh, I didn't have a white mustache, um, in 1991, there was an NDP government that was elected, and I was asked to write uh, BC's Freedom of Information Act. And I was the uh, lead public servant working with a fabulous team, some of whom are here, and Daryl and many others, to get this legislation in place. And uh, I can only echo uh, some of the points that Kirk made in his uh, keynote address. The silence is deafening right now. Uh, when the NDP under Mike Harcourt were elected in uh, 1991, within a month of their election, the phone was ringing. We have to get this legislation done, <clears throat> and we have to get it through the legislature, because if we don't get it through by within six months, it'll never get passed. And uh, thanks to many people, uh, including Attorney General Colin Gilman and Special Advisor Murray Rank and so on, we managed to get that done. The point I'm making is that the promises are great during the election, but if there's one thing you could do after this conference is pick up your phone to your favorite NDP MLA and say, uh, WTF, uh, when are we going to actually see changes to the legislation? I'm, I'm not as optimistic as Stanley. It's been too quiet. Um, and, and the point here is that that applies equally to any government. The time to act on 
getting legislation in place or changing the equation is right after an election because very shortly thereafter, uh, you have things like fast ferries and so on to explain. Um, <clears throat> second point I want to make uh, is, uh, is to talk about a little bit about how important it is for legislation like this uh, to work and how dramatic the impact could be or has been. And as some of you may know or may not know, uh, my current uh, um, hobby uh, uh, when I'm not uh, representing First Nations uh, is stopping Site C. And uh, we've been working at this for about four years and we've made, we haven't made thousands of FOI requests, but we've made hundreds. And uh, between BC Hydro and the Ministry of Energy, uh, we have experienced firsthand in a way that I would have never thought in 1991 and 92, uh, the tools that we equipped government with to resist disclosure. And the interesting part about it is that last night at 8.30, the BC Utilities Commission, who was finally asked to look into this, released a report. They got all the information that was available um, within four weeks that we tried for three years to get. And what they found was massive gaps in the, in the justification for proceeding with this $10 billion project. And uh, so they've called Hydro onto the carpet and they've requested a vast amount of information be submitted, which uh, we'll find out whether Hydro even has. And that's the other experience I've had, which is that often you don't actually, there actually isn't a whole lot of information, uh, but, but um, and it hasn't all been triple deleted. So that's my preamble to how do we fix the system and the way we fix the system is to turn it on its head. And I've been honored with, uh, to work with the Hoyat First Nation on the West Coast, New Chalneth, uh, for the last 25 years. And uh, they are a treaty nation. Uh, don't have to be a treaty nation to do this. But uh, they've enacted uh, a Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act uh, with a little help from yours truly and full support of citizens that effectively changes the whole approach. And uh, I've, I've handed out copies of legislation, not, not because I'm uh, going to chase around with business cards afterwards, uh, but, but rather because um, there will be a quiz. Um, the, now, this legislation takes, some of it will look awfully familiar, but there's a couple of uh, steps here that uh, are worth noting. And the focus is on records management. That's the starting point. You actually have to know where all your records are and how to find them. And you actually have to put them in a form that facilitates uh, disclosure. But then what the Hoyt do is that every March they go through all of the categories of records and the types and categories, and this is listed under Section 4, and they define what items are going to be released. So it's proactive. So they actually create a reading room of documents, and anything that's created that's in those categories goes into the reading room. And the way in which the documents are created is designed to separate that which can be released from that which can't. And they have a much broader, expansive view, which will be music to the ears of my colleague, uh, uh, in terms of how to come to that decision. And if you look at Section 5, basically the balance is between does the disclosure significantly outweigh the harm? Uh, 
try upholding and respecting the Constitution and Hawaii laws, or promoting open and accountable and transparent government, or making government decisions in the best interests of present and future generations, uh, promoting best governance practices. So there's a, a, a long list in Section 5 of the reasons why there should be considerable disclosure. And then that's balanced with the usual uh, list of harms. Uh, as you can see, they're uh, pretty much all harm-based. And so what happens in Huayet is that records are placed in a reading room as they're created that's made available so that it's not a question of waiting months and years to find out what information uh, you can have access uh, to. And, and I think that's the path forward. I think the path forward isn't to drill down and tinker with the existing legislative model. I think the, the path forward, or one path forward, uh, is to just start fresh with a brand new model. Now, in the case of uh, the Hwayat, there is very much a um, a form, a forum, and an approach that uh, encourages and allows citizens to have quiet citizens to have a direct role in this. And um, despite some of my friends who are not all that keen about. Uh, internet voting and all that sort of stuff. I don't actually see in principle why there isn't any reason this couldn't happen on a broader basis than uh, a, a smaller community. Uh, so you'll see at Section 8 that the People's Assembly, uh, which is Hwayat citizens, may by resolution passed by 60% of eligible voters who vote, so 60% of those who vote, not 60% of everybody eligible, uh, can designate a record. So they can say, hey, we're sick and tired of this, uh, uh, not getting this information on a particular issue. Uh, we want it in the reading room. And uh, legally, uh, if it passes, it's got to be in that reading room. And so, you know, we, the, the equivalent situation would be, and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, instead of three years, after a year of uh, trying to get information about Site C, uh, if we'd had this type of legislation that allowed for an electronic vote, say, during the last election, we'd have all the information that was sitting in BC Hydro's files. But more importantly, whether it's Site C or whether it's... Uh, critical issue for a First Nation or whether it's a critical issue for Indigenous peoples to uh, determine their future uh, through their institutions, not our institutions. You need information to do that. And this, this is one model that's working that enables that. There's also the usual public interest disclosure section, which is at Section 9. And... Uh, Shout out to every information and privacy commissioner since this legislation was bought in. Shame on you for not making Section 25 work. I, I thought I had a winner when uh, uh, the previous commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, said, well, I think we better have another look at Section 25. So we stacked up about four feet of news articles, hundreds of submissions, and we said, well, if there's ever a case where the public interest override should come into place. It, it's a dam that is the biggest project in the history of the province. $10 billion uh, has huge impacts on uh, rates. I, th I think we actually have a case here. Well, no, no, sorry. Uh, that's not, that doesn't meet the test of being in the public interest to disclose. So I think that um, as much as, I mean, I, <laughs> this is sort of like a, 10-step, uh, 12-step program here. I'm admitting all the things that I, that I screwed up on in helping to draft this legislation, and I'm begging forgiveness. But, but the point here 
is that there is a different way to do it, and you can't rely on independent officers of the legislature who are underfunded, who are hired because of their expertise in privacy rather than FOI, to be the strong advocates. You've got to build it right into the legislation so the, the individuals, all of us, who need this information to make it a functioning democracy have the ability to say, no, we need the information. The protection of privacy provisions are fairly straightforward. Uh, as you can tell, I'm, a, I, I'm more on the FOI side of this equation. Uh, but we do uh, have strong privacy safeguards in this legislation, and we have a strong focus on records and information security to protect against triple delete and other uh, uh, creative ways to, um, uh, to both prevent disclosure, but also uh, to manage very carefully uh, the type of disclosure of personal information that can ruin a person's life and cause, uh, uh, put them significantly at risk. Um, I won't go into all the, uh, all the uh, aspects of this, we, um, it does provide for an independent review every four years, and uh, uh, former Information Privacy Commissioner David Lucadellis conducted the review and uh, gave it his seal of approval after this had been enforced for four years. Uh, and, and so I'm not here to, I'm not putting on my sales hat. All I'm saying is that um, in this era where the federal government finally, after being in denial for so long and being the last Western, well, the last country in the world to be a holdout, and where BC on September 6th said, okay, we are going to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Part of that is achieving reconciliation, and part of that is enabling First Nations, Indigenous peoples across this country to uh, govern themselves in the way they see fit and with the information Indigenous people determine they need in order to uh, uh, you know, conduct government in the way that is consistent with thousands of years of history, culture, uh, and protocols. And, and so the Hoyat have chose this way to accomplish that. And uh, it's not for me to say that other First Nations should follow this path, but it's something to look at. And, uh, but it is, I feel totally uh, free to say that uh, it, the BC government ought to be popping by the Hoyat and and thinking about this, because the problems that are endemic in the current FOI model aren't going to go away with tinkering. They need to be addressed in a systemic way. And uh, how will that change things? Well, that'll change things in this way. And of course, I keep coming back to this because it's been my life for the last few years in every other minute that I'm not working. Imagine if uh, three years ago, the B.C. government had decided not to proceed with Site C. Imagine if they had an extra $8 billion to spend on reconciliation, to spend on proper uh, services and funding, funding true reconciliation, funding services for Aboriginal children and families in a way that uh, is completely different than the previous government can even imagine. Imagine how different that would all be if those were the priorities rather than building a white elephant. And what has stood in the way of that is lack of access to information because what we've learned today is that BC Hydro is an emperor with no clothes. They don't have a good justification for the need for Site C, the cost for Site C, and continuing with it. Now, last point. This is a bit of a diversion, 
maybe from from the topic uh, that I'm addressing, but but uh, there's a phrase in uh, the Hoyat language in Nuchalneth, and uh, there's a similar phrase in many uh, First Nations, uh, and in the case of Hoyat, the word is Hishuksoak, which means everything's connected. And I think that non-First Nations people and First Nations uh, have a huge opportunity here in terms of building their respective governments in a way that makes information something uh, that, that empowers and makes for better decisions. Thank you. I almost made a call. <laughs> Good afternoon. <clears throat> I was wondering where to start this. And uh, <clears throat> they say to start this with humor. So if I can indulge you for 60 seconds. Uh, I bike to work. And I work down on Carroll and Hastings. <clears throat> and on my way to work, uh, one morning, I'm passing, I'm driving up Pender, and I'm going to turn left onto, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going up uh, Carroll Street. I'm going to turn left on Pender on my bike. So I get to the intersection. Are, does anybody cycle here? So when you're going to turn and you kind of stop, you know what this means, right? And you're waiting to turn. So I'm waiting to turn as I'm doing this. And there's a white kid walking across the street towards me. And he looks at me, and he raises his fist, and he goes, Power to the First Nations people, brother! Power to the First Nations people! I turn. There's the building security guard looking at me just like, Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that's my incidental bit of humor with this. Uh, my name is Wami Shamilton. I work as a journalist and a photographer with Discourse Media here in Vancouver. We do long form, uh, deep dive, and nuanced investigative type of stuff. And right now, uh, I'm in the middle of an investigation that is looking at what reconciliation looks like in small Canadian towns. But last year, when I uh, did a series for Discourse, I did a series on freedom of the press and First Nations. And uh, part of that series looked at transparency and freedom of information insofar as it related to First Nations. The thing that uh, sparked my interest in this was when the Monmouth Treaty, which the Huwait are a part of, uh, was struck uh, 2010 now, I believe. And I ran into a former MP, or an MP, then MP in Alberni, uh, of all places in Tim Hortons in Alberta, where I worked as a community news reporter for seven years. And after reading through some of the uh, bits about the, the treaty, I, one thing struck out to me. And the thing that struck out to me was that uh, much like the Nishka Nation before it, the Nishka Nation were the recipients of BC's first modern day treaty, they had adopted the Charter of Rights and Freedoms they had crafted a constitution and had written into that constitution the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And that was of interest to me as a journalist because I thought, does freedom of the press in this group of First Nations or this First Nation now apply? And I asked that MP that. And he said, I don't know. And I always remembered that. And I, there was no place for me to really go with it where I worked. <clears throat> and I was bogged down with too much community news reporting to be able to devote the time necessary to really chew this. So when I uh, came to Vancouver in 2014 to do a graduate degree in journalism, I tucked away two ideas for a thesis. Uh, looking at freedom of the press in First Nations was one. The other idea was to 
document the experiences of indigenous sex offenders who'd been banished from their communities. And I went with the former for my thesis and published a series of stories about it two years ago. But I tucked the idea away about it, freedom of the press and First Nations back in the back of my mind. And when I graduated, I met Aaron Miller, the owner of Discourse Media, and we talked. And I talked about the second idea I had for my thesis, and she said that would be a perfect series of stories that you could do for Discourse. We allow the time, we have the space, we've created a reconciliation space to write reconciliation stories in. Would you like to work for Discourse at least, you know, for the summer to, to research this? And well, of course I did. And I chose to look at the uh, Nish community, uh, which is in northern BC, the Nass Valley in northern BC, about an hour and a half outside of Terrace, to be precise. And I chose them because, again, they were the recipients of Canada's first modern day treaty. They had a uh, public legislature where the business of their uh, four nations is conducted. And it was an open legislature. <clears throat> So I decided to go for myself and find out whether there is freedom of the press or not. And I went to the legislature and it was a funny experience because I sat and took my place in the, where the public sits, there's a small public area, and I was asked to stand and I was introduced to the legislature because I was the first journalist to sit in their legislature and cover their business. In the years since their treaty had been negotiated and finalized and that their legislature had been created. They have had issues from time to time where journalists would parachute in, do a story and parachute out. But no one had stayed and covered the day-to-day the -day business of the legislature. And it struck me very odd because that was a question I was asked not so much today, but quite often when I first became a journalist, like why by other journalists. Why can't we cover business inside of First Nations? What goes on inside of First Nations? Well, I can only speak to my First Nation as, a, as an example. I'm a, people think there's this homogenous group of First Nations people and people don't realize that, yes, I'm First Nations, but I'm as much a stranger here in Vancouver, in Sewaston, Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, as anybody else. But having said that, uh, back to Nishka, they have an actual working legislature. They, they uh, admitted that freedom of the press now applies there, but no one goes to cover them. This happened at a time when the, the guts of the media business and the carpet that the media business stands itself on was pulled out from under it. Uh, newsrooms were decimated. So a lot of newspapers fell, particularly community newspapers. And uh, the community newspaper that sits nearest the Nishka people in New Ayanch, where their legislature is located, is an hour and a half away. And uh, that editor, now retired, uh, had told me in the course of an interview that I just, I don't have the budget, I don't have the bodies. I wish I could send somebody when their legislature is uh, sitting. I just, I can't do it. And the, the nation itself didn't have capacity in the way of journalists. Like no one, no one was becoming a journalist. Uh, people were becoming doctors, people were becoming lawyers, uh, people were be going to school to get educated in economic development and business and such, but no one was going to be, be a journalist. Uh, there was a guy uh, trying to make a go of a, a micro website, a news website, and I answered, he certainly had the heart and the desire to be a journalist, but he just didn't have the skill. He couldn't keep his thing going. So he couldn't cover the business of their legislature, even though he knew it was important. And I understood what he was saying. Because for seven years, when I lived in Alberni, I covered, uh, worked for the Alberni Valley News, and I worked just as a general assignment reporter. But in and amongst the, the stories that I would cover were those from city council, regional district, school board, port authority, courts, all public bodies that did public business, that were funded publicly, that made decisions, that impacted people that they had the right to know about. Nothing monumental 
went on in Alberni. It was basically meat and potato stuff for those seven years. But that meat and potato stuff was the stuff that impacted the people in the valley. And they ate that meat and potatoes. They needed to be informed. They needed to be aware. They had the right to know. And I was sit and take my place at the little media table in Port Alberni City Council Chambers and just cover every three weeks the the month-to-month -month business of the City Council, which included budget meetings once a year. And it was a given. They were obliged to allow media access. They were obliged to answer media questions. They were obliged to provide media space. And you sat and you covered the day-to-day -day business. It may not seem thrilling, but it was informing. And it was making people aware what was going on with the tax dollars that they funded the city with and the decisions that were going to be made <clears throat> that impacted them, and I find that to be universal. Fast forward, when I went back to Ianch and covered their legislature for a week, they were making decisions that impacted 8,000 people, 8,000 of their members. They have a membership of 8,000 plus. They were presiding over decisions regarding budgets that were going to impact people. Yet there was no media. I was the only reporter, and I just happened to be there on another assignment, my own assignment. How would these people know? The, the government, the legislature, had a communications division, which did its level best to provide information to the, the uh, people, but th these people were uh, employed by the legislature, <clears throat> and uh, they weren't journalists. They couldn't distill the complexity of what was being discussed. And whatever they put out to their membership had to be screened first before it was. And that made me scratch my head. Because, as like I said before, I covered civic affairs in the little town that I worked in. At no one time did the mayor, the school board chair, the regional district chair or the port authority chair or any of their underlings ever call me to say, hey, uh, can I look at your stuff before it goes to print? I just want to make sure. Well, no, that's not ever going to happen. Not on my watch while I was a reporter and certainly not on my editor at that time. The thing covering those affairs for those seven years taught me was the value of transparency and openness where governance is concerned. And it's something most people take for granted. That was particularly valuable to me in Alberta when I covered the affairs of one of the local First Nations that was doing a study with the Port Authority and the city that was examining the redevelopment possibilities for the waterfront. Nothing wrong with that. Good plan. Underutilized waterfront. Good idea. Except for one thing. When I would go to a city council meeting and sit in and listen to when a councilman discussed this issue, I could sit and I could cover it real time. If they made a decision, I heard the discussion. I heard the context in which this decision was made. And I could do the same thing with the Port Authority, which was federal, which sat at another table. But again, it was public. I could go to their meeting when they discussed this issue. I could listen to it. I could hear and understand and distill the context which made up the decision they finally made. I could not go to the First Nations band meeting, which was discussing it, which is not to say that they were inaccessible because they weren't. I could call after the meeting. I could speak to the, the uh, CAO or the chief counselor to say, so what was the decision? But I couldn't be there real time to listen to things that were said, who said them, what interests were being uh, catered to, what weren't, who had an interest in what, why, what decision did they arrive at, how come. Those, those are things that I would have the right to ask at a city or the Port Authority. But I couldn't there. And that always struck me odd. It struck me odd because how else do people get to know you? Allowing access is the portal to your world and your people. Having transparency is that portal. <clears throat>
Mr. Botterill mentioned that he uh, works for the Huwait. Incidentally, it's he shook it, Salwak. He shook it, Salwak. That's my language. It means everything is connected, everything is one. Down the way from the Huwait are is the Yuklula First Nation. And the Yuklula First Nation is part of the Monas Treaty as well. They also have their own uh, FOI Act. Uh, ostensibly, that's a great thing, and it's a good thing. How often it's used, I can't say. It's a brand new thing that I think even the nation is wrestling with how to use and how to deal with. But internally, it's another story because there's a group of citizens that are having trouble accessing information from their own band, which is no longer a tribe under the, first, under the Indian Act. They're a new treaty nation, but they're even having trouble navigating their, own F, their, their nation's own FOI policy to get information about what their nation's legislature is doing that impacts them that they have the right to know. So it's not an easy thing to deal with. Uh, the new nations have adopted, again, the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Many, uh, the Nishka, the Huea, the Sawasan, I apologize if I'm pronouncing this name wrong, but the Tlaman, now have the, their own treaties and are going to have or already have their own information acts. It's like a new thing and as much as we wish uh, it could operate on all, all eight cylinders or all ten cylinders now, this is a new thing and it's going to take, I can see that it's taking them time to get used to it. It's this brand new thing that they don't quite know how to use yet but they know that they have to use or that they should use. It's new, and I understand the time that it takes. But my, and it's only one instance, but the, the situation in Euclid that I mentioned, just involving a small group of people, trying to get information about their own nation using their own FOI Act, but being uh, stonewalled at every turn and having insurmountable costs that little people don't have the money to deal with. But they're trying to get information about something that's going to impact them. They may as well be dealing with the provincial FOI or the federal FOI. Like, what's changed? And it should change. But that being said, that's been my experience as a reporter who worked for seven years covering public affairs, municipal affairs, in public chambers for seven years. And I did so as a journalist, but I was a journalist who happened to be Indigenous. I wasn't there in my capacity as an Indigenous person doing journalism. There's a difference. And later when my interest uh, went to Ayanch to see how freedom of the press was going there, again, it was in my capacity as a journalist who happened to be Indigenous. And there's one last thing I found, and that's this. Uh, transparency, where governance is concerned, isn't necessarily a new thing. As I was to find, and it is only in one nation's uh, experience, in one nation's culture, and all nations are different, but in their culture, historically, they had accountability. Historically, they'd had transparency. It wasn't necessarily a new thing, and it wasn't necessarily a foreign thing either. So I hope I provided some information to uh, at least inform you a little bit and to make you aware. I hope you found a little bit if a little bit of value or a nugget that stands out that you might have a question about. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I hope you like my joke. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Those were amazing presentations. And... Um, now I see people lining up for questions, so this is fantastic. So we'll get right into the questions. Is this working? Yeah, good. Uh, Daryl Evans. Um, Rob, a question for you. Uh, when the Act was created in BC, uh, we had a directory of records. I'm sure you're well aware of that because you probably designed it or, or uh, yeah. uh, put it in with your plan. Um, that was canned about four years later, I recall. Uh, and it was substituted with a directory of personal records, personal information directory. 
I thought this was a terrible piece of sleight of hand. Uh, they said at the time that, that no government ministries or bodies were actually doing anything with the directory of records, that it hadn't been maintained. And I think part of the justification was that also people weren't, they felt the public was not using it uh, to locate records. I don't know if that was true or not. So uh, when you talk about a reading room, uh, is this more or less what the directory of records was intended? And what do you think went on with, why was that so easily disposed of? Um, well, a couple things. One is that the directory of records envisioned uh, when the legislation was first brought in uh, was intended to both assist um, applicants and those that are trying to find the records to find it. But uh, if you don't want to find the records, <laughs> you don't need a directory. And, uh, and so um, the slippery slope started. Uh, it's, it's not... Uh, specific to any political party, it's uh, holy smokes, we don't want that to go out. How do we make it, how do we stop it going out with, while well, we're still saying that the legislation is great? Well, you cut off funding and you eliminate the directory records, so, or you change it or modify it or simplify it or make it useless. Um, so, this legislation that I've been involved in putting together um, sort of goes back to basics and says, well, we need a director of records because we actually want to know what we've got. We want to be able to find it and we want to figure out which parts of it we're going to make public in, in a reading room where there's no application fees, there's no, there's no, you know, you just go down, you just go in and you just find the information you want. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi, I just have a question, I guess, for all three. Um, so your FOI laws, uh, provincial and federal, don't apply to bands or tribes, and um, I wonder if, if they should or some alternative to it. I mean, uh, morally, do they see this uh, tribe's privacy as a kind of political autonomy, and to what extent should natives be accountable, not just to the members, but also to the larger outside public? For example, uh, Stephen Harper published chief salaries in his some kind of financial accountability act. I don't know the name of it. Trudeau pledged to repeal it. I don't know if he ever did, and if you agree with that. Also, the First Nations Health Authority, based in Vancouver, spends millions of dollars. It's not covered by any FR law, federal or provincial. Should it be? Do you want to take a run at that, or, and I'll jump in? Or? With respect to the FNFTA, it's funny you should mention that because I was just uh, thinking about it. The, um, I was never convinced that that was ever used properly, but I have a different view. It was never used properly because one, it was imposed, but two, two things were forgotten, two things were completely overlooked and never written about when it came to the FNFTA. And I think that they were critical and I think that they were important. Those two things, in my view, were number one, 95%, I would venture to guess higher, of the tribes who did file with the FNFTA, their books were just fine. They were fine. The second thing that it didn't show, these tribes that filed that were just fine were poor as church mice. That was never, that angle was never taken, that was never reported, that was never shown. And the second thing that was overlooked with respect to the FNFTA, I remember the Rancor when it was first, uh, discussion about it first happened. And the Rancor essentially involved the criticism of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation leading the charge with that. And understandably, there was criticism on the part of First Nations about the, the Canadian Tax Federation doing this. And I understood. But what was completely forgotten to this day in that conversation, just gone, forgotten, 
was that the CTF had advocated on behalf of a small group of First Nations people that couldn't get access to any information from their tribe. That, that was forgotten in the whole conversation and the whole discussion, gone. So those are my views on the FNFTA. I didn't see it as necessarily threatening. Having said this, like I said, didn't see it as threatening because most of the tribes that filed, their books were just fine. That's what the data showed. Uh, with respect to the First Nations Health Authority, I don't know, has anybody asked them to create their own FOI process, their own transparency process? I'm not aware. That's not to say that that isn't the case and that isn't so. And I may very well be unaware of that, but I don't think anybody's asked them. Well, I did, I did ask for records and they refused and they, they made up their own rules and uh, would charge a $50 application fee and of course no appeal to the commissioner, so it's uh, ineffective, it's nothing really. So. Or maybe, maybe Rob could write one just for the uh, health authority. <laughs> And the law, as I understand it, the law as it stands now, or where things stand now, it is up to individual tribes and nations whether or not they have their own FOI process. Some have moved in that direction. Certainly BC's new treaty nations have moved in that direction. So I wouldn't say that that is not necessarily the case. It is in fact the case that things are moving in that direction. Is it moving at glacial speed? Yes, it is. Should it be moving any faster? If you want to be careful and you want to get it right, no. You know, I'll just make one observation. Um, and, and maybe I sound a bit like a broken record, but um, on the morning of September 7th, uh, the world changed in BC and uh, Canada and BC have now adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indi Indigenous Peoples, and that fundamentally uh, reinforces the fact that uh, Indigenous people have a right to self-determination, and it's got to be respected in a whole lot of different ways that it hasn't been in the past. And so uh, it's not so much up to people like me to say this is what you should do. It's, it's up to people like me if asked to uh, offer advice on how to carry out the wishes that are established by Indigenous people for their own nation. I wanted, my name is Paul Gallant and I am um, neither a reporter nor a lawyer. So <laughs> thank you for allowing me to be here. <laughs> I work in healthcare, uh, and I've just spent a year actually working with Aniska. It's been a privilege to spend some time in northern BC, uh, probably one of the most beautiful places on the earth I've ever been, and working with some of the most beautiful people in the world I've ever worked with. Uh, I just want to echo what the speaker, whose name I cannot pronounce and I will not try, uh, so elegantly talked about in terms of open government, and I'm sure there's certainly areas of, of improvement, but. I was, I was privileged to spend uh, three full days out of a five-day uh, special assembly with NISCA, which happens every two years, which basically is a full public, uh, every citizen is invited. So you get approximately 700 to 1,000 people showing up for a five-day meeting, uh, which is, you know, a lot of fun. However, I, I can only last for three days. What I did notice uh, amongst uh, the NISCA people I worked with was certainly uh, transparency, uh, certainly um, so transparent that in some cases, one or two of the people I spoke with said, I don't know why we need freedom of information or privacy laws here, because our families and our nation has so based on relationships and knowing each other's business, so we take care of each other, that why do we even have these regulations? Uh, I'm not gonna say how many people said that, but. Certainly in terms of looking at their entire health services review and looking at the assets of the, the NISCA nation and having us be part of their community for a certain amount of time, I would say, whereas a, a white person, we often think we go into these communities and, and we're going to share our wisdom with them, and that certainly wasn't our, my thought, but there's so much learning to happen from that community in terms of the way we look at either freedom of information or transparency that I think sometimes we need to shift 
are thinking and to say, I walk in the other person's shoes, I'll actually learn lots by being, observing, and looking at their ways. I guess I should ask a question, <laughs> but I don't know what it is, so I'll save that for later. But thank you for listening. And I did have a question initially, but I know the next person behind me, I think, is going to ask or address that. So thank you. Hi there. So um, thank you for your presentations. Uh, my name is Carol Ann Brewer, and I work with the Lekwalams Nation in uh, northern BC. Um, I'm Okanagan, actually. I've been a lawyer for approximately uh, 34 years and practiced uh, Aboriginal law for that entire time. So um, when I speak about this, uh, a, a lot of the work that I've done has been in self-government, and, um, and I know that there are a lot of misapprehensions, including uh, that there's a gap and there's no, uh, no um, legislative legislation that applies to certain institutions and, uh, that are First Nations, and that's simply untrue, um, that uh, there is either federal or provincial or indigenous law, and uh, um, sometimes in, where indigenous law is not in place, um, uh, and uh, there, there, are, there are maybe conflicts of law um, issues and whatnot, but uh, there is always some law that applies. So um, I just wanted to correct that um, statement. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that with respect to the presentation about uh, um, enacting legislation at a band level. I think um, ha from my experience, certainly, what I've observed and what was observed by the uh, Royal Commission on Aboriginal People in 96, I believe it was, was um, that, uh, and, and subsequent commissions and whatnot, have a lot of the... Um, the the concerns with respect to uh, access to information within the um, Aboriginal governments and First Nation governments relates to um, an actual uh, administrative capacity um, or lack thereof. And in fact, I've worked in federal government departments as well, and quite often you'll find that the records are not that great there either. So, um, and, and the, the, the provincial governments as well. So I think, um, uh, I, I don't know that it's always um, a design. So it may very well be a design, but um, I know with respect to First Nations uh, governments that um, you, you're often responding to a lot of, um, like there's a, huge volume of, of issues that you're responding to, everything that every other government um, uh, manages, um, and, but you generally have a, a, a lot fewer employees and, uh, and you have um, a lot uh, of limitations in terms of those employees. I mean, not everyone wants to go and work in a remote community. So uh, those are just some of my um, sort of comments. I didn't really have a question for you, but uh, I just wanted to clarify what was said before. Yeah. Mr. Bauer, I have a quick question for you, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so can you just explain a little bit about how the, uh, how the, the Indigenous Act, the Indigenous, so the Hawaii Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act relates to the provincial and the federal law? I see that in, in the treaty there's a, a presumption that the federal and provincial laws apply, but then there's an op opportunity for them to be superseded. So I imagine in this case, this is a public, essentially a public sector access Exclusive jurisdiction. So, so would yeah. they, could they enact their version of PIPA and then have PIPA be superseded, say for example on like the, the, per, the Personal Information Protection Act? Right. Um, yeah, they could, yeah. They, they, they would, to the extent that the records are created by the Hawaiian government under their constitution, they have the jurisdiction to establish the laws regarding the collection, use, and disclosure of that. Um, in terms of their businesses, uh, if they're registered under, which they are under provincial law, then the extent that provincial laws, uh, provincial laws would apply, but. Um, you know, all the significant records that relate to uh, 
citizens' ability to hold uh, their way at government to account are within exclusive jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, do we have any more, do we have any more questions? Okay then, well, thank you so much. Thank you again to our speakers. Thank you, thank you for all the questions and this wraps it up.